horse, this is White Horse, stand by for salute report 2-1, over. White Horse is Brown Horse, stand by to copy. Line Sierra, 2-0 personnel. Line Alpha, patrolling what appears to be a headquarters break. Line Lima, 3-8 Sierra. Tuesday, April 29, 2003, roughly two months after U.S. forces invade Iraq, BBC News releases an article that is so strange it seems to go against the very nature of our reality. Now, in order to understand the true significance of this article, we need to take a journey back in time, all the way back to approximately 2,500 years before the birth of Christ, and to a place that we now know as modern-day Iraq. And it is here that we begin our story. Tales of supernatural beings can be found all over the ancient world. The Bible, the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Giants, as well as other ancient Jewish texts, all speak of an event where fallen angels descended to earth and fooled mankind with their knowledge of science, war, and beauty. It is also recorded that these fallen angels, or watchers as they are called in the ancient text, manipulated the genetics, the DNA of mankind, creating an actual race of giants as well as other hideous monsters using animal DNA. Descriptions of these disgusting beasts can be found in the Book of Giants, which, by the way, was part of the Dead Sea Scrolls collection. Parallel to that, other ancient texts speak of the same exact event, except it's from the fallen angels, or the Watchers' perspective. In ancient Babylon and Mesopotamia, for example, the Watchers were seen as a good thing, they came to help mankind, and they showed people how to do cool things. And they also created a mighty race of giants, men of renown. However, biblical accounts reveal these things to be evil, fallen angels led by Lucifer himself, who want nothing less than the total destruction of mankind. Quote, According to Mesopotamian myth, there were seven Apkalu before the flood and four afterward. The word Apkalu comes from the Sumerian ab, meaning water, Gal meaning big, and Lu meaning man. They were considered only partly evil, occasionally dangerous, and capable of malicious witchcraft. They were chimeric in appearance, usually depicted as humanoid with wings, or sometimes as hybrid birdman or bizarre fishman creatures. The antediluvian Apkalu were divine, just like the Watchers. According to one story from the Babylonian period, the Epic of Era, Era was the god of pestilence and plague. Marduk banished the Apkalu to the Abzu as a punishment for provoking him to send the flood. Hmm. Supernatural beings linked to a global flood who are afterward banished to the abyss? Sound familiar? Interestingly, the four Apkalu who appeared after the flood were only partly divine and could mate with humans. Again, like the Watchers, the last of the post-flood Apkalu, Lunana, who was two-thirds Apkalu, matches the status of Gilgamesh, who was described as being two-thirds divine and one-third human. On the cylinder seal, Gilgamesh is called Lord of the Apkalu and is elsewhere credited with bringing back great knowledge that existed before the flood. Scholars who have made the connection between the Apkalu and the Watchers tend to interpret the way the Watchers are portrayed in Jewish literature from Second Temple period, like the Book of Enoch, at least partly as a Jewish response to the Babylonian captivity. It was believed that the Apkalu, though potentially dangerous, had preserved secret pre-flood knowledge prized by the pagan wizards of Babylon. To the Jews, however, such knowledge was evil, and the Watchers were portrayed accordingly in Enochian texts." End quote. So, we have one epic story seen through two different lenses. On the one hand, we have the creator of the universe, the God of the Bible, telling the story. He is saying, yes, these fallen watchers are evil and you need to avoid them at all costs. And on the other hand, we have the account from the watchers themselves saying, hey, that little guy, referring to God, I wouldn't worry about that little guy. How about that little fella? How about that little guy? I wouldn't worry about that little guy. Quote, Scholars have known for years that there are parallels in the Mesopotamian legends and the biblical accounts of the patriarchs. Enoch is similar to an antediluvian king named Emadaranki, and Noah is variously called Unapistim in Babylon, Zisudara in Sumer, and Atra Hasis in Akkad. But even those accounts are part of a fallen realm military campaign, a supernatural psyop. For example, 
The accounts from Mesopotamia portray Gilgamesh as a mighty warrior, a hero, two-thirds god and one-third man. He has adventures and slays monsters, notably Hambaba, the defender of the faraway cedar forest, who'd been assigned to terrorize humans by the god Enlil who is Enki's brother. In the second temple Jewish account known as the Book of Giants, Gilgamesh was, himself, one of the gigantic offspring of the Watchers, as was Humbaba, the monster Gilgamesh set out to kill. This is how Gilgamesh was viewed by the Jews between the time of the Babylonian captivity and the birth of Jesus. Basically, he was one of the Nephilim." End quote. One of the Nephilim in case you don't know what a Nephilim is, it's the unholy offspring between the fallen watchers and a human woman. Yeah. Moving back to Gilgamesh, he was a giant, part supernatural being, part human, otherwise known as a Nephilim. Now, here's where it gets crazy. Scholars actually believe Gilgamesh existed. And not only that, this article from 2003 the BBC News put out says they may have actually found his tomb. Quote, Gilgamesh tomb believed found. Archaeologists in Iraq believe they may have found the lost tomb of King Gilgamesh, the subject of the oldest book in history. The Epic of Gilgamesh, written by a Middle Eastern scholar 2,500 years before the birth of Christ, commemorated the life of the ruler of the city of Uruk, from which Iraq gets its name. Now, a German-led expedition has discovered what is thought to be the entire city of Uruk, including where the Euphrates once flowed, the last resting place of its famous king. I don't want to say definitely that it was the grave of King Gilgamesh, but it looks very similar to that described in the epic. Jörg Fassbinder of the Bavarian Department of Historical Monuments in Munich told the BBC World Service's Science in Action program, end quote. So let's take a look at this in the big picture and see if anything makes sense. Because as of now, this whole thing still remains a mystery. First off, the Bible says there will be a time when the Nephilim return. Some people believe this is a spiritual return by demonic possession. Others believe it's physically, as in a return of the giants. Fast forward 2,000 years, archaeologists find Gilgamesh's tomb in Iraq, two months after US forces take over the country. Is it possible that when news broke of the discovery of Gilgamesh's tomb, orders were given from the highest possible levels of government? and US troops arrived at the site to seal it off. DNA was collected from the skeleton and brought to a top secret underground research lab where tests were conducted. Tests involving cloning technologies and CRISPR-Cas9. Of course, the only thing we can do is speculate. So what do you think about this? Do you think they really found Gilgamesh's tomb in 2003 as this article states? If so, what happened to it? And why is there no mention of the contents? Or maybe what they found was so insignificant that they thought all news coverage should just stop. We are observing everything to the west of that MSR. Can you see the palm grove in the northwest quadrant? Call contact. Format, I see two prominent palm groves. Not sure which one you're calling. Okay, okay. Do you contact the dump truck heading north in the quadrant? Format, contact the dump truck. In about a minute. 